Welcome to Historical Conquest, a game where you can actually use real people from history to take over the world or bring world peace. You get to decide for your ultimate goal. Now, to start off, as I'm going to tell you about, um, these are starter decks. Starter decks have 50 cards in them. Actually, they have 51. There's a, an extra card in each of these decks. And these are all world history. Well, these ones are just focused on something like this is World War II. So all the cards in here are just on World War II. The Revolutionary War, the Civil War, the Romans, the Wild West, the Crusades, and the Civil War. So you'd use these to expand on any one of these decks, and they can be used with any one of these decks. So to get started, let's take off all these cards from all these decks from here. When you get your first starter deck, you open it up. The first thing you're going to find is the rule sheet. This will give you everything you need to know on how to play the game. Now putting off to, off to the side, because I'm going to teach you personally. This is your deck. Now there's 51 cards in each pack, as I said. So you want to be able to take those cards. And the first thing you want to do is you want to separate all your land cards. That's these cards. Boom. They're green here with about a, a blue background. Put those off. Separate all of them. And then place them on the far right side. Now, the rest of the cards in here have everything from conquerors, leaders, and armies, but also inventors, technology, businessmen, and economists. I mean, it has everyone from history. So you take those cards, and you put them in your stack, right, just right next to the, uh, the land pile. This is called your deck. Now, to start off your game, you grab five cards off the top of your deck, and this is going to be your hand. Now, in your hand, you have five cards, all different, with all different abilities. But to start your civilization, you need to grab one card from your land pile. So we're starting in Libya, which is in Africa. As you can see at the bottom of the card, that's really important to, to recognize because you want to make sure that if you're in the same continent as an opponent, those are the lands that can attack each other. And if you're in the same land, you want to beef up that land as much as possible. So just say that my opponent was in Morocco, also in Africa. So I know that the first thing I want to do there is I want to defend that country from my opponent. So I'm going to play the strongest person I have. The bottom right hand corner, there's two numbers. 3,000, 2,000. First one's your attack, that's 3,000. Attack or defense is 2,000. So I'm going to place them right there. They're going to be able to defend that, that, area, that land from their opponent. Now, say I find a blue card like this. It says Explorer. Now, the reason why it says space is basically to give you a reference of what kind of explorer they were. Uh, Gus Grissom was an explorer of space. If you want to find out more information about him, read him right there. If you want to be able to know how he works within the game, read in the abilities right there. That's how great the, the game is set up. So with this, um, with an explorer, I basically place them right next to the land that's already active. And because I played an explorer, I can always find a new land. So every explorer finds a new land. Another great thing about an explorer is they can transport. So say I have a card in the same land as Gus Grissom at the beginning of the turn. At any point during the game, especially at the end, it's a nice little move if you want to move around your cards at the end of the turn, you can actually move that explorer and that one card with it. Now say he wants to move around an army. He can do the same thing. Only one explorer can move each turn, and they can only move one time. So only one transport can happen per turn. So putting these back how they were. Now, say that I have, um, well, let me tell you about these areas. So each turn, you can only play three cards per turn. One, two, three, so I'd be done. But I'm gonna show you this just to help you with uh, your next turns. Say I have a technology card or a knowledge card, maybe an event card like the Donner Party or something else. All those cards have to be played in your, on your mat or in your area, called your civilization. So in order to play them, they're, if they were a land, they'd be placed in the first row. That's only lands get to be placed right there. If it's a person or an army, so a character or an army, it'd go above that land that it's occupying. So this is an army here. I can have three other cards here. Only thing is, I can only have one army per land. So if it's not a land and it's not a human, or even an animal, sometimes the animals are used as characters, then it's placed over here, which is called your active area. And this is just not this 
not just this row, but also over here as well. But don't put them in this spot. This rectangle right here, that's your discard. So say I want to discard a card at any point, I get to discard them right there. Now, for discards, you know I'm allowed to have five cards in my hand at any turn, at any time, up to five cards. If I want to, if it's my turn, and I'm playing cards, say I played one card, and I want to discard two other cards, I can do that. It frees up space for me to grab new cards off my deck. Hopefully I'll find like an explorer or an army or the card that I'm looking for. So every turn I can play three cards. One of them can be played here and two can play, be played here. Maybe two can be played and one be discard. You get the gist. So um, another thing I'm going to do is as soon as I'm done playing my cards, so I played my three cards, and say I did not, let's hold off on the ones I didn't, that were pulled from the side. Um, now that I've played my three cards, by grabbing cards from my deck, because I'm allowed to have three at the end of the turn, I'm allowed to grab three more, or however many I need to have five cards in my hand at the end of the turn, this would signal to my opponent that it's their turn. Now also, you're only allowed to touch this deck at the end of your turn. If you play a, I'm gonna introduce you to a very important card that you wanna know, an interrupt card. See it says interrupt right here? Interrupts are solid gold because that's like a surprise attack against your opponent. If your opponent's attacking you, say they're playing, okay, you know the experience of the Donner Party, um, people getting lost in the mountains, Rocky Mountains. Well, because the ability, um, because of the history, the ability says that you lose 300 morale points and you can't attack for two turns. Well, what would happen if I played an interrupt? Say my opponent played Donna Part on me. I played uh, JP Morgan. His abilities are interrupt, reverse any event card uh, your opponent plays. Automatically, I'm reversing it back on them. So they would lose the 300 points and they wouldn't be able to attack for two turns. That's why they're solid gold. That's why you want to keep these around and you want to keep them in your hand just for that surprise attack. Now say I want to free up some space and I really don't care if my opponent sees that I have JP Morgan. Well, I can still use the ability at any point, but um, the interrupt, basically that surprise, it's no longer a surprise. My opponent knows I have it in my hand or have it in my civilization. So it at least freed up some space here so I can find my next card, but at the same time, um, the surprise is gone. So it's just another thing to, to understand. Now, uh, going on, say I drawn my, drew my five cards, or up to five cards, and it's my opponent's turn. Now, for the first two, first round, I can't attack my opponent, they can't attack me. Now that's land to land. An attack is land to land. But they can't also interact with me as well with any cards. Basically allows me to set up my civilization, allows them to establish theirs. So any of these abilities, they become mute for the first turn while we're establishing in the civilization. But on the second turn, I can play something like the Darner Party or the San Francisco, San Francisco Earthquake on my opponent. Or I can also attack land to land. And I'll show you how to, how to do that. But first off, I wanna show you something else that's really important. One thing that I played is Alexander Graham Bell. His abilities are increase your morale by 400 points. Um, Gus Grissom also says, due to national pride, increase your morale by 300 points. So that would, right here, is your morale counter. Now, in order to win, it's either world domination, as I'm, I'll, I'll tell you about later on, or it's increasing your morale up to 3,000 points. If I get to 3,000 points, I win the game. But in order to do that, I play Alexander Graham Bell, which gives me 400 morale points. I play Gus Grissom, which gives me another another 100 points. Now you're allowed to have, you're allowed to accumulate 800 morale points per turn. After that, it basically goes away. So if you accumulate like, if you play enough cards to play 1200 morale points, sorry, you still only get 800 morale points. Now, in order to attack land to land, and this is why I'm giving the morale points first, um, but also, while we're on it, I've already explained this a little bit, but the Donner Party, decreases your morale by 300 points. It would show up on the morale counter. So if my opponent plays this against me and I didn't have a reverse, I'd have to drop mine from 700 down to 400. I'd lose that. 
Now this can only be played on their turn, because it's a turn-based game. But you get the understanding that you wanna be able to climb your morale up as high as, as fast as possible before your opponent does. And something like the Donner Party, the San Francisco Earthquake, the Great Depression, or the Black Plague, all these ones will decrease your morale as you're trying to accumulate it. Now, in order to attack my opponent land to land, as I was saying, my African country to his African country, my army has to be satisfied with me. So they have to be up to 800 morale points. Basically, they're not gonna attack, they're not gonna fight with me if they don't like me. So, to get up to 800 morale points is very important, but you have to be at 800 or greater in order to attack your opponent. Now, say my opponent has Morocco and they have two armies on here. Or sorry, they have an army and another person. Say mine is Libya, which is in Africa. Now, if I was to attack my opponent, I would have to count up the attack points, which is the first number, which is 3,000 here on the Nicaragua Contras. My opponent would attack, would count the second number. Now, the Mongolian army weren't that the best at defending. They were always good at t attacking. Um, a politician, of course, is not very, very good when it comes to um, attacking or defending. So they're going to be a lot less in attack and defense. So the defense is 1,000 plus 120 points. Okay, so 1,120 versus 3,000. Obviously, I'd win that attack. If my opponent um, loses, or actually whoever loses, no matter if it's the attacker or the defender, the loser loses 100 morale points. So I would have to drop, if I as the attacker would have lost, I would have lost 100 morale points. But if my opponent loses, they not just lose 100 morale points, they wouldn't have to drop their morale only, they'd also lose a character to their discard pile. That would mean one less person to attack, and you're allowed to attack twice per turn. You think I'd attack again? Of course. So I still have 3,000, but now they only have 1,000. Obviously, I would win again, and that person would have to go to the discard, or army would have to go to the discard. So all of a sudden, Morocco is un, um, unoccupied. If it's unoccupied, I can simply walk in and take that land. But here's the thing. By me just having one card in the land that I was attacking from, that automatically means that Libya is unoccupied. And if that's true, my opponent can walk in there and take it. There's two ways of doing that, though. Because you can't just walk over from North America to Libya and, and take my African land. That makes no sense whatsoever. So what you'd have to do is you'd have to have an explorer. Your opponent could have an, have an explorer come over here and take that land. Or say they had another African land, they could actually walk in and basically take it. And it would be, it'd be without an attack. So there's no attack, the opponent would be able to take it and I lose that land. So if you're going to attack your opponent, it would be smart to have somebody in that land to help you, that if you leave, to be put placed in the land that you you take. So say if I take Morocco, that would come to my side, and I'd move either my army over here or that other person, but I need someone defending both lands at the end of the turn. So ongoing, I would now have three lands, and they would have one less land. Now, say that Morocco was their only land. If Morocco was their only land, guess what happened? I just dominated the world and I win the game. So just because I took over Morocco, their one land, they lost the game, I had world domination. Say they had three lands. If I whittled them off, so in the end they had no lands left, again, I would keep that land and I'd win the game. So the, the point of the game in the strategy is you want to defend your countries with as many people as possible. Because say I had, say my opponent attacked me this time. I had one land left and he attacked me with enough strength to take out one of my people. So he, my opponent attacks, I'd have to lose one card if I lost the attack. If he attacked a second time, I'd have to lose another one, like Gus Grissom. But because I had three cards in each land, or maybe even a fourth one, I'd still have enough people in that land 
to defend it for one more turn. They could not occupy it at the end of the battle. So because of that, I'm gonna give you a little strategy. Always have three or more cards in each land. But watch out, there are also cards like the Alamo. The Alamo will actually allow you to attack not just two times, but as many times as you need in order to take over land, but just one land. So if he attacked me from Morocco, and I was in Libya, and he had a stronger army in that land, he could attack me as many times as he wants until I had no one left, and then he would be able to claim Libya as well. Okay, so that's a little bit about the attacks. Again, to win the game, two ways of winning. One, by getting your morale up to 3,000 points, or by in accumulating all the lands from your opponent. Now, say that I had, I had Mor uh, Libya, I had stolen Morocco from my opponent, I had Colombia, and then I found another explorer. Say there was another explorer that I decided, you know, I want to play this guy, but my lands are full. Well, you don't have to stay on the mat. You can actually go off the mat and find a new land. So, one of the greatest games I've ever played was actually against a tournament champion of Magic the Gathering, and he used a lot of the, the same concepts to play that this game as he did that that game. And within three hours of playing, he had 15 lands, because he stole from me, his girlfriend, and his girlfriend's mom. Interesting enough, this is also a guy that didn't want to touch this game because it had to do with people of history. And he didn't like anything to do with history. He'd rather play with the fictional. But he used the same strategies, and he even plays it to today. So, this is not just a, a history game, but it's a really fun game to dominate the world or to bring world peace. And we have everything from starter decks, much like uh, Magic and Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon. We have expansion packs, which these are all solid decks. If you buy Tesla twice, you get the exact same cards in both. But if you buy Tesla and Bodicea, completely different cards in each deck. And with this new 2.0 version, you actually have, that's coming up, you'll actually have a uh, rare card in each of these decks. So, another great thing to do with that. The expansion decks are used to expand on that deck. Say I want an emphasis on World War II. Say I like World War II a lot, and some of the things that are in there. I can put that with any of these decks. I can take out some of the cards from the Tesla deck I didn't like, or I'm not gonna use. Say if I wanna go for just morale or just for world domination, I'm gonna customize my decks to get the strongest decks possible. Now, there's always new decks coming out. The new one that's coming out, actually, hopefully this month, is Mount Vesuvius. Mount Vesuvius has a lot of what are called downer cards, like the Donner Party, except they're on the Mount Vesuvius. The Galveston Hurricane, which is the worst hurricane ever, and it was in the year 1900. Um, the Colony of Roanoke, I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Um, all these different really interesting uh, things that have happened and yet not many people know of. That's what we focus on with this game. So I want to tell you, I want to bring out some uh, other things that have come up in other YouTubes. People have asked us these questions, and so I want to bring them up so that you can understand them. So I've gone through the, the regular play, but also um, there are three ways of winning. Again, morale. You can win by world domination. You can also do a hybrid of either one, whichever works, uh, works better, or which one ever you reach first, or you can do a tournament rules. Tournament rules is where after you play the game, say you play for 30 minutes, you set a time. We're playing for 30 minutes, we're playing for 45 minutes, and then say I have four lands, and I have, let's say, 1,500 points. My opponent has 2,200 points, morale points, and he has one land. Well, tournament rules are for every land that you have, you get an extra 300 morale points at the end of the game. So I have one, two, three, four, four times 300 is 1200. That would bring me up to 2700 points. As I said, my opponent had 22 and he had one land. He got to 20, 2500 points. In the end of the tournament, or any the end of that set time game, I got the 2700 points. I was 200 points above him. I win the game. Also, um, there's another rule that's come up, and this is not in the rule sheet, but a lot of people have um, gotten them up out of their seats, gone around to their opponent's uh, mat, 
and been able to count up all the strength points that their opponent had before attacking. Now that doesn't really make sense. There's no risk in attacking. Why would I attack if I knew I was gonna lose? So, and they would actually count up the attack points on theirs and then know, or sorry, the defense points of their opponent and they know what their attack is. So automatically they know if they'd win the game beforehand. Makes no sense whatsoever. So, as an internet rule, this can become a house rule if you want. It's not in the rule sheet, so you choose. If a person stands up and walks around the table to look at someone else's deck, or even stands up to look over the table, they automatically lose 100 morale points. So their morale goes from 2,700 to 2,600 because they got up to look at their opponent. Some opponents will actually say it's worth it to know if they're going to win. That's their choice. If they're playing for morale, don't get out of your seat. Okay, another thing is the difference between stealing and borrowing. Um, so there's a lot of people in the game that will say you gain the use of your opponent's technology card. So say I have a technology card and I put it in play. All technology cards, knowledge cards, event cards, they have to stay in the active area at least one turn before they're discarded. So say I have this um, technology card here. If my, my card... Sorry, let's say my opponent has this card. Say my card says that I get to um, use the abilities of that. That means I get to use that abilities. They keep the card, but I get the exact same abilities. So if it gives, gives morale, I get the morale. If it gives me the ability to eliminate one of their people, I get to eliminate one of their people. Or if it's the atomic bomb and they just wiped out one of my lands, I get to do the same thing on them. I can only do that on my, on my turn though. So say... It increases my morale by 300 points, or incre sorry, increases their morale by 300 points, and I get a card that says I can use their card. I can't play my ability to take their technology until afterwards. So one of the one of the things that has come up before is if my opponent plays 300 and wins the game at 3,000 points, great, he won the game. Well, the other person was a little bit set off because they had an ability to use that ability as well. That means they would have won the game as well. Well, you can't take some, or use someone else's ability, unless it's an interrupt card, until your turn. So that person claims it first, and then you get to claim that ability on your turn. So that's one of the things that's come up. I just want to make sure that you guys knew that. All right, another thing is, now say my card says I get to confiscate that technology. Well, confiscate means I get to use it in my land. I get to take it from them and use it in my land. They no longer have it. It's wiped clean from their, their knowledge. I get to use it and I get to use their abilities. Even if they have already used the abilities, I get to use it as well. Now, I was telling you about the discard pile. This is another thing that people have asked about. The discard pile. What happens if one of my cards allows me to, to bring back one of these, these cards? I've already used the ability one time, but now I'm bringing it back a second time. Wait a second. That means I get to use the abilities twice, right? Yes, actually that does. If you take it from the, the discard, it means they're taken out of play. If they're out of play and brought into play, it means you get to, the abilities start all over. That's only if they come from the discard pile. Okay, another thing. That's, that's the difference between abilities and um, stealing abilities and using abilities. But what if you steal a character? Now say my opponent has somebody in their land, and I have something like William Shakespeare. Well, William Shakespeare allows me to take one of their opponents to fight on my side. Well, the abilities, again, I can use them. But try to keep track of these cards. Sometimes it's hard, which is actually the reason why we introduced using sleeves. You can't, um, in the end of the game, it's really hard to say, oh, this is my card if I'm the yellows. I've got a pink background, I know it's not my card. So if I have all my yellows and I have one pink in my deck, I know it's my opponent's and I can give it back. Otherwise, you can write it down on a piece of paper. But that's one of the things, one of the things we had to resolve between some of our players because there was arguments about it. But say I, use, uh, I received the Ice King from my opponent, I can use the abilities, which would be to increase my morale points. And so that's another thing. But say I had four people in this land and I try to take somebody else from my opponent. Say I wanted to take this person. Well, my lands are full. What does that mean? It means I can actually discard one of my other characters. Say like, 
a guy that increased my morale, but his strength is really low. He's not really needed anymore. So he goes to the discard pile, and I'm able to take that card from my opponent and use him in my own car, in my own land. And I get to use their abilities as well. But if I had four cards in here and I didn't want to get rid of any cards, I couldn't place this card in this land because I already had four. So you have to follow up the rules. Um, also, if I have, let's say I have my five cards and I want to play, and I don't have any more space. Say I don't have any more land. I don't have any more space. What do I do? I want to free up some space from my, my deck. I can discard them, like we talked about earlier. Or, again, I can remove one of the cards and replace them with another card. That's what replacing is. So I have now three cards in here. But say, oh, wait a second, I played this guy. Say I played someone that gave me morale points. I, I eliminated Lewis, Cl Lewis and Clark and replaced him with Alexander Graham Bell. I got the 400 morale points. Well, I cannot discard him right away and put another card down, say another card that gives me more morale points on the same turn. I have to wait till the next turn before I can discard him. So you cannot play him and discard him on the exact same turn. Any cards, whether it's a person, whether it's land, whether it's some, something that goes in the uh, active area. Another thing, so another thing that's come up in the um, questions from my opponent, from uh, our players, is a duel. This could be Aaron Burr, it could be Cthulhuin, or it could be the Colosseum. Anything that duels you against another op your opponent's cards. If um, if I play these cards, I get to. Depending, if the card says I get to pick the opponent that I go against, then I get to pick the card that I'm going to duel. But if it doesn't, so Alan Burr, he will duel with any one character of your choice. Okay, so I get to pick which one. If it if that part was not in there, my opponent would pick a, a card, I'd pick a card, and we'd be able to duel out. The loser goes to this card, whether it's the Coliseum, Cthulhuin, or Aaron Burr. The character with the largest points wins. They stick around in a duel, you die. You go to the discard. So, um, another thing, there are house rules, so you guys get to decide this. This is your game. So create house rules. Um, if you have any questions, you can always ask us. We'd love to help. Um, uh, I guess the, the last thing I'm gonna talk to you about is the difference between an army card and a character card. Now, when your cards say, pick a character, that means a one sing a single person, single person. You might have even two people, like the Trung sisters, that's still a character card, because it's just two of them, but if it's an army, army cards are distinguished by saying army, and it means a plethora of people, a lot of people, which means if I have a lot of people on that card, and, I, and my card says I can take a character from my opponent, I can't take an army card, I can only take a character. So. That's the end for the tutorial. I hope you learned something. I hope you're able to play this game. If you have any questions, please put them in the comments below because we'll use that to make our next tutorial because we're gonna make the ultimate tutorial. There will be no questions afterwards, hopefully, so that every time a person comes and plays the game and they watch our YouTube, they know exactly how to play. No questions asked. We're gonna try to make it as short as possible. This one was a little more long-winded because I want to get all this information out. So uh, give us any questions you might. Uh, might have, put them in the comments below so that we can answer them and use them for the next tutorial. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Take care. If you have any comments or questions, add them to the comments below. Otherwise, we'll see you next, uh, we'll see you tomorrow actually. Take care. Bye.